see where you're really at. <laughs> Inside the skull. Okay, you see it there? Inside the skull. It's isolated. It kind of looks like a bath or a mod. Moth, bat or moth is how it's described. <clears throat> That's what it looks like by itself. There's a superior view, there's an inferior view. It's a beautiful bone. Uh, <clears throat> and there's a lot of different parts. It is. Because it looks like a bath or a moth, bat or a moth, it looks like it has wings. And um, I have wing one. Let's do the saddle part. Saddle turns it off. Follow the order of the study list. A little saddle right there. That structure there. So what we're looking here is a superior view. Let me put this back in the skull. So there's a superior view of the cranial base with the sphenoid bone in it. Okay. So when I isolate it. And give you that same view. That little depression there is called the sella tersica. <clears throat> means Turkish saddle, I guess. It does mean that. It just looks like a saddle. But what it is for is the pituitary. The pituitary, pituitary is in there. I think I have that here. <clears throat> I have the central nervous system here with the, with the sphenoid. And I'll, I'm going to kind of zoom in here. Do you see that little thing sitting in the, in the, in the saddle? I'm going to point to it. Here's the pituitary and then the cell tersica. This is the pituitary and the fossa it's in is called the cell tersica. Pituitary gland is the major gland of the endocrine system that secretes hormones that control many physiological functions, which you'll learn about in 431. I'm going to go back and isolate the, the sphenoid bone. <clears throat> the parts of um, bat looking bone that are wings, that's, those are the two greater wings. Okay. Now from the side, you see how those wings form externally? Turn off the muscles. We get it down to the skull. What you're seeing, highlighted in green, is part of the greater wing of the sphenoid bone. Greater wings. Let me 
form, oh, when I say, I'm going to say lateral skull, they form other things too. If I uh, re isolate, when I put it back in the skull, when you look at the thing anteriorly, let me see if I can hide the eyeball there. Let me just get rid of it. The greater wing forms part of your eye orbit on the back. If you look at it on the inside there, from a superior view, <clears throat> what's in purple there, if you put it back with the temporal bone, that forms uh, the, the middle cranial fossa. So they form a lot of structures there. Those are the greater wings. And you have a smaller wing called the lesser wings, which I'll highlight now. What's in purple now are the lesser wings. Okay, so here's a superior view of the lesser wings. They're kind of, in this vantage point, they're kind of superior to this. So they're kind of forming a shelf right there. And that's going to form actually part of the anterior cranial fossa up here. Okay. Let me show you from a slightly different angle so you can see how that lesser wing is above the, the, that part. cranial fossa with frontal bone. So greater wings, lesser wings. Right by the lesser wing, there's a little hole that I want you to look for. It's for the optic nerve. That hole right there, going through the lesser wing, is called the optic canal. You got two of them, one there and one there. Optic canal, that's where cranial nerve two, optic nerve exits. see that the eyeball is going to be right on the other side of that. Okay. That's the optic nerve. Yes, cranial nerve 2, that's the number. The name is optic nerve. And eventually you're going to have to know both. So inside the skull there, do you see the optic canal on the other side? See it right in there? That it, that's it from the inside of the eye orbit there. So when you get the eyeball in there, you, you can't see it, but there's a nerve going right in there through the optic canal. <coughs> Let me hide some stuff. See on the inside of the cranial base, all those nerves are exiting, but <clears throat> I'm highlighting what's in purple is the optic nerve, cranial nerve 2, exiting that canal. And you can do the same thing in our models using a bottle brush or... So 
something. Uh, I don't have anything here, but usually I have you take a pointer and you should kind of stick things in the holes in the skull. <clears throat> There's a pointer in here. Oh yeah, it's right there. And you can kind of stick it through. See where it comes out. Okay. Oh yeah, there's there's the um, jugular foramen right there. Okay, so you can see that it really is a hole that goes through the skull. <clears throat> the next thing is um, the <clears throat> there's a lot of holes in the sphenoid. <sighs> Superior orbital fissure. Yeah, there's a fissure. There's a superior orbital fissure and an inferior orbital fissure. The superior one is on your study list. The whole fissure is like here, but only this part right there is the superior orbital fissure between that part of the sphenoid and the lesser wing there. There's a little fissure, and all these nerves are coming out of there. So let me um, re-isolate the sphenoid <coughs> just to show you the fissure by itself. I'm going to zoom in there, but I don't highlight it, but um, that's the fissure, right? Here. To identify things, you know, point to it or put something through it, and I'll say identify. The stick is going through there, or whatever is going through there. The superior orbital fissure is between part of the, the lesser wing and the greater wing there, and the fissure in between. Superior orbital fissure. Fissure is kind of a crooked hole. And basically there are, there are nerves coming out of there that serve the eyeball. There's a lot of them. The cranial nerve too has its own hole, but the, the other ones that um, service the eye include cranial nerve three. <clears throat> four, uh, a branch of five, V1, okay, and abducens, cranial nerve six. All of those exit the fissure. That's a superior orbital fissure. And if you look on the other side of the bone, from the inside, there's these three small holes, and they're kind of all right in a row. I'm gonna zoom in at that depression there. Let me see if I can just uh, Three holes I want you to know is right here, that smallest one. I'm going to really zoom in. It's so small. It's a perfect small hole and it's called the foramen spinosum. perfect small hole, there's an artery that goes through there called the middle meningeal artery. It enters here. It doesn't supply blood to the brain, but it supplies blood to the, the membranes that cover the brain, that are connective tissue, the meninges. The dura mater, the arachnoid, the dose, hence the name meningeal, supplies blood to that. Now, um, <clears throat> the other two holes I want you to know allow cranial nerves to exit. This oval shaped hole right next to the frame and spinosum 
is called foramenal valley. Crown nerve 5, a division of that goes through there. It's uh, V cranial nerve V3. There's three divisions of cranial nerve 5. One, two, three. I gave you one here, exit superior orbital fissure. Three exits here. Cranial nerve 5, division 3, foraminal valley. There's a round hole a rotund round hole right next to this one, right there. Foramen rotundum, and that allows um, the exit of cranial nerve 5, 2, division 2. Foramen. Rotundum. Cranial nerve. Five, second division. So I'll put V2 to indicate that. <clears throat> so to review all those holes, we, we say that there's this one here. Optic canal, cranial nerve 2 as it's there. There's a fissure there. A lot of cranial nerves exit there. Okay. Three... Did I say four? Yeah, four. V1, six. And going from bottom to top, frame spinosum, the artery enters there, the middle meningeal. This one here, uh, V2, um, V3, V2. Foramen ovale, foramen rotundum. I want to show you the middle meningeal artery. That's an important one, clinically. Get rid of the nerves first. Well, before I get rid of the nerves, there's a um, the ganglion of the trigeminal nerve, cranial nerve five. Do you see how there's three things coming off of it? Those are the three divisions. One, two, and three, going from top to bottom. Here's V1, and exits the uh, the fissure. There's V2, frame of tendon, V3, frame of valley. Okay. And you can look at pictures in your book that show that too. They exit the skull. They can't stay in the skull, can they? They won't do anything. They gotta exit the skull and serve structures. Let me get rid of the nerves. Okay, let's look at the blood vessel. Let me hide the jaw. arteries that one there there's a small artery going through that small hole this is the middle meningeal artery I'm gonna isolate it Let's see look at it from the inside there okay now look where that is on the inside of the skull that one's important it has a lot of branches if you receive a blow from the other side on the lateral aspect of your skull, right around um, where the bones are the thinnest on the side of the skull, right around here, right by the greater wing. On the other side is that artery in, inside the middle, um, inside the, the dura mater. And so if you have a fracture there, and that sharp edge of a fracture lacerates the artery, it could cause an epidural hematoma. If you're bleeding on the brain, inside the skull, outside the brain, okay, Epi epidural hematoma. So that's why that's important to know uh, clinically if you get a skull fracture. <clears throat> Little arteries on the other side. Okay, anything else there? That covers it. For the sphenoid, I'm going to do the ethmoid. The ethmoid is basically inside your nose. Let's reset here. I can kind of get to it in the medial eye orbit there. If we're looking inside the eye orbit. 
in terms of eye orbit, what I've talked about is, I've talked about the frontal bone, that forms part of the eye orbit. I've talked about the sphenoid bone, that forms part of the eye orbit. This bone right there, that forms part of the eye orbit, but other things is the ethmoid. I'm gonna isolate it, or hide others. That, there it is, there it is inside the skull. Let me fade others, so you can kind of see how it is inside, right around your nose, right around your nasal cavities. Okay, well it's isolated. That's what it looks like by itself. Now I'm zooming in so you can kind of see it looks big, but it's not big. It's a very delicate bone. <clears throat> Ooh, right in here, look at that. There's a reason why it's put inside this case. It's very delicate. I'm like scared to touch it. So delicate, where it's like flaky, it's that big. This is your ethmoid, there it is there. Okay, it's not that big. Um, be careful with this one. I would say, don't touch it, just look at it, like my son, but you guys actually have to study it, so I'll allow you to touch it, just be careful. Okay, there's the ethmoid. The structures you gotta know, basically this bone, it's a lot of features. Now what's the proper way to breathe, through your mouth or through your nose? Nose. You can breathe through your mouth, and that's how they open up the airway when you intubate, when you can't breathe on your own. But you shouldn't breathe through your mouth. You should breathe through your nose. It's kind of set up for that. This, bo this bone can help. We teach the airway starting with your nose, not your mouth. That's part of the, the digestive tract, okay? The only time you breathe through your mouth is when you have to because you're congested. And that's very uncomfortable. Right. The ethmoid, some surface features. One is the cribriform plate. Cribriform. You breathe through your nose. What sense is conveyed when you? Do that. Smell. Smell. Okay. So this has to do with that. This plate has these little tiny holes on it called the olfactory foramina. So let's look at a superior view. Let me um, get the surfaces there. Um, on both sides there, that, that's the cribriform plate in purple. And it's hard to see on the app. You, you really kind of have to look at a, at a real skull, okay, to get a sense of the little holes that pepper through there. Page yeah, yeah, okay. That page is um, Look for the cribriform plate with olfactory parameter. Olfactory is the sense of smell. Olfaramina is a little hole. Those little holes allow the transmittance of, um, well, basically cranial nerve one. Okay, olfactory fibers. Little holes that allow cranial nerve one, olfactory fibers, to exit for the sense of smell. Those fibers are going to kind of like terminate in a little mucosa, uh, a little, little epithelium that actually catches the odor molecules. Let me see if I can show you that. I think I saved that. Okay. Let's see. Now, let me just show you when you get into cranial nerves.
there's a big bulb. It does let me show it, and let me see if I can point it out to you. There's a big olfactory bulb, not to be confused with the olfactory fibers. But the bulb gives rise to the fibers. So I'm, I'm way zoomed in here, but this is the cribriform plate. There's all these little holes on it. Those are the olfactory foramina. And these little fibers there are the olfactory foramina. You see how they kind of go down there in the olfactory epithelium. So when you sniff, the odor molecules kind of bind these fibers and transmit the sense of smell back through the bulb to the part of the brain that picks up the sense of smell. All right. So cranial nerve one refers both to the bulb and the fibers. To me, it's all the same nerve. Okay. <clears throat> so that's the cribriform plate. I'm going to re-isolate that bone with the olfactory foramina. Christy Gallet. I'm going to highlight that. It's a term that means cox cone. It's that part sticking up. This is a lateral view. Here's an anterior view. Here's a lateral view. I'll zoom in. It looks like a cox cone. Christy Gallet. That's what the term means. Think, Krista Gallagher. Well, I have it listed under cribriform plate, so I'll just kind of list at the same level. It's a rooster. Right, it's supposed to look like that. That's how it got its name. Well, anyways, what it really does is it anchors something called the Fox, Fox Cerebri. It's a bony process that anchors the Fox Cerebri. Now the Fox Cerebri, I'll get to it when I teach the brain, it basically is a connective tissue structure. It's made out of dura mater. The Fox Cerebri is dura mater. It's a dural membrane. And this false cerebri helps anchor the brain in place. So basically it anchors the brain by anchoring false cerebri. I do have a picture of that because I want you to know that when I get to the brain. Folks, it's right here. See that big thing, highlight it in green, going from front to back. That's the false cerebri. Cerebri refers to the cerebellum, your left and right cerebrums of the brain. This goes right between them, from posterior to anterior. So when it goes anteriorly, I don't have the, I have the sphenoid here, not the ethmoid. It's gonna anchor right there at the Christigalli. Okay, so that's kind of what it anchors to. That's usually what we say about it, uh, the Christa Galley. I'm going to move on to the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid. Now, if I fade others, you can kind of see how the ethmoid forms part of the nasal septum. If I unfade and just look at it straight in the nasal cavity, you can see there's a sliver of bone sticking down. Okay, that sliver of bone right in the middle is called the perpendicular plate. So I'm going to isolate the ethmoid. I'm going to do parts, surfaces. That what's in purple there is the perpendicular plate that forms the superior part of the bony nasal septum.
nasal septum divides your nasal cavities into two. Septum in between. We say bony nasal septum because part of that nasal septum is cartilaginous. So bony means it's part of a bone, in this case, ethmoid. So there's an inferior bony nasal septum formed by the vomer, but I'll teach that bone later. Okay, so if you look right inside the bony nasal cavity there, you can see the perpendicular plate sticking down. Um, a part of this bone's function is to help kind of slow and warm and humidify air that you breathe in. Because if you breathe air directly in, you want to break up that rush of air so it doesn't dry out your upper respiratory tract. And so you want to put stuff in there to help break up the airflow. And that's these structures here, these bony turbinates are called the middle nasal concha. Middle nasal concha. Okay. The ethmoid. They look like little, well, I don't know what they look like, but they hang down here on either side of the plate, so they're in the nasal cavities. They're in the passage of airflow. Okay. They're described as bony turbinates. That's how they're always described. I'm not sure why that term is always used, turbinates, to describe the concha. What they do is they break up airflow of inspired air. Air you breathe in is inspired air. to slow and warm or um, humidify the air you breathe in. And the air you breathe in may be dusty. You have hair follicles in your nose to help catch the dust particles, stuff like that. And by the time it reaches your throat, pharynx goes down to your um, larynx and then your trachea. You have cilia too to help catch um, debris that's in the air you breathe. And, um, but it starts with the bony turbinates, the middle nasal concha, helps break up the airflow. You force air to go around it. That creates these little eddies of airflow. So the air column is kind of broken up. Okay. I think that's it yeah. for ethmoid. We'll stop there, and um, I'll pick up a skull after the lab practical next week, Wednesday. Now you should be gearing up for lab practical to use the rest, rest of the lab time. Do you remember what time to show up on Monday? 10 a.m. 10 a.m. I'll see you then on, on Monday. For now, let's get ready. <coughs>